as Hammond says, Forewarned is forearmed, Miss Daniels. And so if you are looking to prepare for an impossible run, then this is the guide for you. The Dead Space remake Impossible Mode is the pinnacle challenge for the game, and it follows in the tradition of hardcore modes for all three prior games. As a long-term fan of the Dead Space series, this has always been the most exciting way to play the game, and a satisfying achievement, and so I knew I had to tackle it in the remake as well. Of course, the rewards are worth it as well, the burnished suit and the iconic one-hit kill hand cannon. Another nice feature is that if you start a new impossible playthrough after beating it once, it will show you your best time, meaning you can try and beat it on subsequent playthroughs and improve every time. In this guide I will provide some tips, tricks, suggested loadouts, how to master and dominate the hybrid combat system, as well as highlighting some dangerous specific moments in the game to watch out for. But before we get started, if you like Dead Space content, then consider liking and subscribing for more. I believe that the best way for me to do this guide is to break it down into certain segments, which are as follows. General tips and tricks, combat mastery for peeling and dismemberment, loadout suggestions, and finally highlighting some dangerous parts of the game. I believe this will give you all the tools and knowledge you need to conquer impossible mode. So let's get started with the general hints and tips that helped me in my various playthroughs. My first bit of advice is pretty basic, save frequently. Your mileage may vary on stronger machines, but my game crashed frequently on my Xbox Series S, and the last thing you want is to redo a difficult combat section that you struggle with. Also, if you beat a combat encounter but you feel you were inefficient in regards to ammo and health, you can quit out and redo it now that you know the enemy placements and what happens in the fight. And quite frankly, if you're doing one of these set pieces where you're being dragged by a tentacle or hanging upside down from the hive mind and you think you are struggling or you're panicking, pause the game and close out of the game. That will not count as a death and will not reset your run, and thank god that closing the game doesn't count as a death as the game crashes so frequently for me that I would have lost the run about 10 or 12 times. So having effective saves just means that you can restart if the game crashes from a point that wasn't too far away, or you can redo combat encounters to do them more efficiently. That being said, you should have a broad understanding of how the game plays out, so you can predict enemy spawns and what to expect. I wouldn't recommend impossible for your first run through, and if you are, obviously watch maybe a walkthrough or a playthrough as you're doing it. Being able to predict where enemies spawn and knowing generally what happens in the section ahead means you are less likely to take chip damage from an enemy ambushing you. In addition, when you know there is an environmental danger ahead, such as the centrifuge section, I would recommend watching a gameplay video so you know how it plays out exactly, as these are, and I cannot stress this enough, the most dangerous segments in an impossible run due to the insta-kill capabilities. Sections like the centrifuge may seem easy and you may have done them numerous times before, but just make sure you know exactly what to expect. One simple slip up, or taking something not seriously enough and losing concentration, can mean the death of your run and hours of time wasted. Likewise, you should know when there is a tentacle grab sequence. It is very easy to underestimate these sections, but make sure you have your plasma cutter ready and upgraded so you can quickly cut them. These are also insta-kill moments, so treat these with respect, and when you know they are coming, make sure you have the right weapon, like your plasma cutter or pulse rifle, ready and reloaded. So just as a reminder, these are the tentacle sections. There is one when you leave the centrifuge, there is one in hydroponics in the sticky hallway, and there is one after you kill the hunter in chapter 10 when you're leaving the control room. So let's talk about some more efficient ways to play in general and how to manage resources. When it comes to side quests, I would recommend at least doing the hunter side quest. Yes, this is a quest that requires you to do a little backtracking and go out your way, but honestly I barely encountered any extra necromorphs when doing it. The stasis upgrade you get from the finale of this quest is very worth it. It applies tick damage and completely peels enemies, opening them up for an easy kill. In chapter 10, I would also recommend beating Z-Ball. You may as well, it is easy, and it earns you some loot, including a power node. In the quest for more nodes, I would also recommend that you pick up the Master Rig quest the first time you reach the Captain's Nest, 
in Chapter 4. You can pick up the Supervisor rigs without having this quest, however having the quest just allows you to better track it. You don't need to do this quest, and you don't need to have the master doors opened. However, for going a little bit out your way, you are rewarded with plenty of nodes and upgrades. It is up to you, but if you do decide to do it, in the description below I will link a video from Mr. Rain, who has shown where all the master doors and chests are if you want to keep track of them. In general, I would advise you to take notes of access doors that you can't open when you first find them, ones with level 1, 2 or 3, as these again yield valuable supplies, usually a power node or a weapon upgrade, which is also a power node. For example, there are a couple of level 1 doors that I grab before I leave medical at the end of chapter 2, like the one near the 0G therapy and the one in the hallway between flight deck and medical. Pick up every weapon upgrade you can, even if you don't use that weapon, as you get an extra node for each upgrade next time you visit a bench. And again, this ties into my suggestion about other access doors and the master doors, as these all usually have some kind of weapon upgrade, and that's a free node right there. My next tip is to grab the two extra power nodes from doing the ritual found in the break room in administration, accessible from chapter 4 onwards. I'm sure most of you know which room I'm talking about, the break room, the one which has the ritual circle in it and the marker recording on the wall. As of recording this, there are three known rituals, two of them yield audio and text logs, but the third one gives you two extra power nodes, and it involves you essentially doing stamps and punches in a combination in the middle of the circle. Credit to Dan Allen Gaming, which is where I first saw this code, and I will show the code on screen now so you can pause and screenshot the video so you can do it yourself. Just make sure you're standing firmly in the ritual circle when you do it. But there you go, there's two extra nodes for you with no extra risk. In regards to pickups in general and managing your inventory, you will quite often get ammo drops for weapons you aren't even using, even if they are in storage. However, if you have the space, still pick these up anyway and simply sell them, including O2 bottles. I had a lot of line racks, for example, when I wasn't using the line gun, and they sell for a pretty penny. Moving on to combat basics, I want to give some various tips and warnings regarding specific enemies. One of the most irritating enemies in the game are the swarm, the little bits of swarming flesh that ambush you numerous times throughout the game. This also brings me to the pregnant necromorphs, who burst and drop swarmers, and it's a situation that can escalate quickly if you are fighting multiple enemies at the same time, as the swarmers essentially immobilise you while doing tick damage. And by immobilise, I mean you can't aim your weapon while you have swarmers on you. When we get to the advanced combat section of this video, you will see me singing the praises of the flamethrower, and one of its many advantages is if you kill a pregnant with the flamethrower, it won't burst, it just drops dead. Aside from that, hit their body with a stasis as they burst, so you can get some distance and deal with the swarmers that are coming out. The last thing you want is to be covered in swarmers whilst also being surrounded by a number of slashers. It's a very dangerous situation. But aside from that, there are moments in the game where swarmers ambush you, where they come out of a doorway or you turn a corner and they're immediately there. This often catches you off guard and just results in you losing health for no reason. And in a game mode where you're trying to manage your resources carefully, this should not happen. However, there is a way to predict this. There is a specific musical sting that accompanies their ambushes, even before you see them, just if you're in the vicinity of a swarmer ambush. So take a listen to this. So on my latest playthrough, I was never caught off guard by swarmers, as I was able to quickly react upon hearing this musical sting. When you hear it, I would recommend using a stasis and giving them a spray with a flamethrower or a blast with a force gun. That will deal with them nicely. My next hint regards the guardians. These are the wall-bound enemies that spit out the pods. My warning is pretty simple. Stay far away from them. As annoying as they are at range, they are fatal close range. One of my deaths was the result of me being careless in a combat encounter and getting pushed up too close to one, resulting in an instant decapitation and death and the end of an impossible run. When you get the prototype stasis module, 
you can make really quick work of these guys. In fact, the prototype stasis almost kills them by itself, as well as slowing them down and stopping them from spitting out pods, another reason to do the hunter side quest. You can see how quickly I deal with the guardian duo, thanks to the extra damage done by the prototype stasis module. So my recommendation with dealing with these guys is to stasis them and then use explosive canisters to finish them off or give them a quick spray with a flamethrower. Just make sure to keep your distance. And if you do need to do extra damage or you run out of explosives, just kinesis them and keep shooting off those little tentacles and eventually they'll die. Just don't go close. In general, when it comes to bigger combat sections, you need to learn to prioritize your target identifying what enemies are on the loose in the area and prioritizing accordingly, making a plan on how you're going to take them all out. Now, I know that lurkers are so, so annoying, trust me, I know, but they really should be the lowest priority, as they don't actually do that much damage, they're just very irritating. The damage really comes from slashers and leapers, and in fact the elite variants, the ones with the darker skin in later levels, really can take Isaac down in a few slashes, especially if multiple ones are crowding you. And so incapacitating these enemies is a high priority. And in general, because they are the melee enemies that will rush you, you need to deal with them effectively, as you cannot allow them to back you into a corner, into a situation you can't get out of. The spitters, which are the enemies that look like slashers but actually stand at a distance and spit at you, do more damage than lurkers and you do need to watch out for them. However, usually you can just get out of their line of sight until you deal with the immediate threat of slashers or leapers that are right in your face. So just keep moving, in general that means that the lurkers and spitters won't be able to get a bead on you and do damage to you, while you deal with the melee threats right in front of you. That being said, spitters are actually very weak and go down very easily, so if you have an opening, feel free to quickly take them out before carrying on with the rest of the fight. However, of course the highest priority target is the exploder. Whenever these guys are in a multi-morph fight, you should stasis the rest and make sure there is some distance and kill these guys ASAP. Thankfully, Exploders are the noisiest necromorphs in the entire game. They're one of the reasons I recommend when you're doing an impossible run, playing with headphones. Audio is really important in Dead Space and sometimes the necromorphs are really quiet. If you have headphones on, you will immediately identify there's an Exploder in the room thanks to their very telltale noise. So especially near the end of the game, you'll find yourself in a multi-morph fight and the exploders usually come from far sides of the room to move towards you slowly. And the best way to deal with them is just to get them out of the way immediately. Keep an eye on them and when they get in range, just shoot them, stasis the enemies right in front of you and deal with the exploders. Trust me, it's better taking a necromorph claw in the face while you deal with an exploder than it is actually taking the damage from the exploder. So in general, my advice is this. Keep moving so the ranged enemies cannot hit you as easily. Stasis the enemies that are rushing you, the slashers, leapers and pregnants, get them dealt with and then move on to clean up the rest around the outsides, all the while in multi-morph fights keeping your ear open for any exploders. Talking about stasis, use it liberally on your impossible playthrough. I don't know about you, but because there are survival elements to this game, I am so reticent to use my inventory and my ammunition, but impossible do not hold back when it comes to stasis. Blast stasis anytime there is more than one enemy. Burn through your stasis packs. It is so important to keep alive and keep yourself from being damaged. You can always buy more stasis packs for 2.5k and there are numerous stasis recharge points throughout the game. I know it's hard to break the habit in a survival game, but you really just need to be dishing out stasis as much as you can. Telekinesis has also been upgraded from the original Dead Space to the level of Dead Space 2 making it a deadly ammo-saving weapon. Understandably, some fights are so intense that you don't have the time to notice or pick up a spike. But if you are in control and you can see the enemies clearly in the distance, or if you know a fight is coming and you see a spike or pole on the ground, just open up with a TK as it basically means that the enemy will now be one or two hits away from a kill. And the knockback that it has is certainly not to be underestimated. If you know that there's a big engagement ahead, such as the hunter fights or the cargo bay area, then prepare. I often make sure that canisters and stasis canisters and different spikes that can be used for TK are out in the open where I can clearly pick them up in the middle of a fight. With that all said and done, we also have to talk about the game's bosses. 
Now in general the bosses aren't a huge deal and to be honest I find them a bit more of a relaxing part of the game, especially if you've fought them before and you know how it all plays out. But these fights are why you should make sure one of your precision weapons, such as your plasma cutter or pulse rifle, is upgraded to do good damage. In the Leviathan battles, just manage your O2 effectively. There is usually an O2 bottle in the areas before or in the rooms of these fights, so if you are running out, then open your inventory and check you have one to use. Aside from that, in the second one where you are outside, there is an O2 tank on the far right, on the far left, and in the centre where the door is, so I'd recommend just filling up on your O2 tank as you move between each of the guns. In the first fight, just another little tip, is when you're fighting the Leviathan and it starts spitting balls at you, don't try and shoot these or dodge these, pick these up with TK and throw them back at it, it does tons of damage and also avoids you taking damage from them at the same time. But in general there's not much to worry about here in either of these boss battles. The one that does bother me is the Hive Mind fight, specifically the final phase where you have the upside down section which is an insta kill section if you don't shoot the node quickly enough. My only advice for this section is to make sure that your plasma cutter is upgraded. Now I'm not sure how this plays out on PC, maybe it's easier to aim with a mouse and keyboard, but on console I found this bit very difficult. Thankfully at this stage my plasma cutter was more or less fully upgraded so it only took 2-3 to three shots to actually do this section. And again quite frankly if you are struggling with this bit and you're panicking and you're seconds away from being devoured, just close your game, reload the fight and do it again, you'll get it eventually. Now with combat basics covered, let's talk about mastering combat. In the first chapter or two you don't really have access to a peeling weapon, you really are having to rely upon dismemberment. In chapter 1 and 2 I therefore suggest you rely on stasis heavily. There are stasis recharge stations everywhere in chapter 1, so just freeze everyone and then soon you'll get TK as well as the pulse rifle and its grenade launcher to shore up your weaknesses, but it's really in chapter 3 when you get the flamethrower that the advanced combat can really come into play. So with that said, let us move on to the next segment of this video where I will talk about the hybrid systems of peeling and dismemberment and how by using them together you will master this game's combat and dismantle enemies in seconds while also being extremely ammo efficient. In the promotional material for the lead up to the Dead Space remake, quite a bit of focus was put on the new peeling system. However I don't think the game, in game, effectively communicates how powerful this system is when used in concert with the traditional dismemberment system. The real first peeling weapon you get is the flamethrower, though technically I don't know if it really peels, rather it burns enemies but it essentially does the same thing as a peeling weapon. So this is chapter 3 and up until that point the player is encouraged to dismember with the plasma cutter as they are in the first game, yet dismemberment isn't as powerful as it was in the original game, which makes sense because in Dead Space 1 the original, dismemberment was the only combat system. In the classic Dead Space, limbs would essentially immediately cut when you targeted them. Obviously there are some exceptions when it comes to tougher enemies and tougher difficulties, but you get the picture. The game system was just target an enemy's limb, cut it off and eventually they'll die. The plasma cutter would just cut cleanly through limbs and that was that. However in the remake the player needs to shoot through layers of skin and muscle before the weakened limb finally breaks, and this is really cool because you see the limb getting closer and closer to the bone with every shot you take, however it does take more shots than it would in the original Dead Space, and this is what has led Dead Space veterans feeling like the necromorphs are more tanky than they were in the original Dead Space, especially if they're playing the way they would in the original Dead Space, just shooting at limbs. And if you do play in the original way, the traditional way of just aiming at limbs and shooting at them until they break, you will burn through ammo far quicker than you would in the original game. That is because the peeling system isn't just an indicator of how damaged an enemy is, there are weapons that are specialised to rip off their skin, and the single target weapons like the plasma cutter and the pulse rifle are actually meant to break limbs when they are weakened by the peeling system. This is how you're meant to play.
in these clips, you can clearly see me killing enemies far, far quicker than purely using the dismemberment system. This is gameplay from my impossible playthrough, so the hardest difficulty, and as you can see, I am carving through necromorphs in seconds by using the two game systems in tandem, peeling or weakening, and then dismemberment. This is what I call the hybrid system, combining peeling and dismemberment on each individual enemy to kill them more efficiently. I believe the game should have hammered home how the player should be using these systems in tandem, maybe giving you the flamethrower earlier, but definitely, definitely encouraging you to use these two weapons together to show how the peeling system can be used to enhance the traditional dismemberment methods. As you can see from my clips, the principles are pretty basic. I hit them with a weapon that peels skin and muscle off. Then with a few blasts of a single target weapon, like the pulse rifle or plasma cutter, they are pretty quickly dismembered and killed. The difference is so stark compared to using dismemberment alone, instead of me hammering at one limb repeatedly, three or four shots just to cut off a leg, I'm literally one tapping fragile limbs after using the flamethrower has done its work. Visually it makes sense, using a peeling weapon like a flamethrower or the force gun, you strip the limbs right to the bone, and thus the exposed bone is fragile and vulnerable to dismemberment. And I think visually this is well represented by this clip I'm showing now, where I use the upgraded prototype stasis module, and you can see the skin and muscle peeling back, leaving behind a surprisingly weak looking necromorph that is just ripe for a plasma cutter shot to the arms and legs. This system is so effective that at the end of a playthrough I had so many resources left, ammo, credits, and even things left in my storage, which is pretty wild for an impossible playthrough. The difference is plain to see in these clips. Compare how slowly it takes for me to kill a single slasher with just the plasma cutter, compared to me taking down leapers and elite necromorphs with a flamethrower blast and then a couple of shots from the pulse rifle. It is remarkable. The best methods of peeling, in my opinion and my testing, are the flamethrower, the force gun, and the prototype stasis module from the hunter side quest, i.e. the peeling weapons are the ones that do generalized damage rather than specific precision damage. To surmise, the hybrid system is peeling and then dismembering. Torch the enemies with a flamethrower, rip their skin off with the force gun, then simply dismember the weakened limbs in seconds for an easy, quick and efficient kill, leaving you with tons of ammo and really giving you a certainty of your dominance and confidence going into each combat encounter in the game. I was never frightened that I was going to die in any of the combat sections once I had mastered this hybrid system. With that said, I now want to talk about weapons and the order in which I recommend you pick your loadouts, in a combination that I think helps this hybridised peeling system. So no doubt as you have guessed from the previous section, I recommend that you have both the flamethrower and the force gun, as they are both excellent peelers, damage dealers, and they both have their own utility that I found very useful and they complement each other's weaknesses. The flamethrower is an excellent choice because it is an early weapon that you get and you can master and upgrade it early on in your playthrough. Additionally, it is also excellent at killing swarmers, divider spawn and pregnants, and it also detonates the stasis pack on twitchers. A lot of benefits there already. Its secondary fire throws down a firewall and thus it is helpful for defensive situations. And above all else, when it comes to the peeling system, it doesn't really take much more than a little bit of a quick blast to set them up for a dismemberment kill. And that is one of my favourite things about the flamethrower. It is extremely ammo efficient, really only holding it on your enemy for a couple of seconds before drawing your precision weapon to finish them off. I use the flamethrower on almost every enemy in this game and I had buckets of ammunition left by the end. And even if you do need to buy some, it is very, very cheap to buy it in the store. Overall, it's just an excellent weapon and invaluable due to its utility in the peeling system and with killing the more annoying enemies like the pregnants, the swarms and the divider spawn. It has become my favourite weapon so quickly and it's hilarious because in the original games, it was such a useless weapon. So when I came into the remake, I didn't even touch it for my first three playthroughs. It was only when I was working on mastering this peeling system that I realised it was one of the best weapons in the game. There is one issue however with the flamethrower, 
and it is something you need to get used to. It doesn't really stagger or stop enemies in their place, despite what you'd expect from a flamethrower. In most horror games, you expect enemies to writhe in pain when you flame them up with a flamethrower, but I find it actually rarely happens in the Dead Space remake, and if it does, it is several seconds after you start to hit them with the flamethrower. For example, you can see this leaper carry on as usual after me hitting him with the flamethrower, and he gets a hit off on me. So basically, keep your spacing, keep your distance, and use stasis. This weapon is not good at knockback or staggering. So get the upgrade in chapter 10 for the range, and just keep your distance. Of course, another obvious weakness of the flamethrower is that it doesn't work in the vacuum. No oxygen for fire out there, so use a different weapon when you're outside. Turning to my second favourite weapon, the force gun. For me, the force gun is a great get out of jail free weapon, a good panic weapon. It is also the most effective peeler in the game. I'm sure most are aware of the appeal of this weapon. It is easy to use, has great knockback, and does decent damage, as well as ripping the skin clean off a necromorph in one hit. To be honest, when you upgrade its damage, you can just destroy everything with it with two to three blasts, no cutter required. This is of course useful in areas where flamethrowers will struggle, like in areas where there is little spacing, like the lifts or the elevators, or the more frantic areas of the endgame when you are just constantly getting rushed and you just need a bit of space. Like the flamethrower, this force gun also detonates the kinetic module of Twitchers, and it is effective against divider spawn and swarmers. It's a lifesaver when you are panicking and have your back against the wall, giving you some breathing room. I would strongly recommend this weapon over the line gun for example. After some upgrades, the force gun can save you no matter what situation you find yourself in. Just as a side note, make sure you don't forget the force gun ammo schematic found in the Zero G Tower with the electrical hazards in Chapter 6 in Hydroponics. This is definitely one of the harder schematics to find in the game, and if you want to buy extra ammo, you will need this. However, that is the weakness of the force gun compared to the flamethrower. It is not as ammo efficient, I usually don't find I get as many drops for it, and the ammo is expensive to buy in the store. So I would recommend mainly using the flamethrower and whipping out the force gun when you are in trouble. Beyond these two exceptional weapons, I also use the plasma cutter and the pulse rifle, both as precision tools for weak points and finishing off peeled enemies. I find the plasma cutter better for weak points, like with the hive mind or the tentacles, but I find the pulse rifle better for finishing off peeled enemies, and its ammo is cheap and plentiful. Of course, you could replace one of these with the line gun. It destroys peeled enemies very effectively as well, and of course it has the overpowered trip mines. However, in my opinion, I just don't find it as ammo efficient as the other two, nor is it as useful for weak point sequences like the tentacle, and I think that it doesn't work as well with the peeling system as I am suggesting, but it is up to you and I would happily see this replace either the plasma cutter or the pulse rifle. When it comes to the order of acquisition of weapons as you get them through the game, I would recommend of course picking up the pulse rifle anyway, even if you do plan to swap it for the line gun or another weapon, as you really have limited good weapons in the early game, and with the pulse rifle at least you get access to an early heavy weapon in the form of its grenade launcher. In my opinion, the Ripper isn't great for the harder difficulties. I find more often than not that it gets me too focused in on one enemy, and it takes a few good upgrades to become truly effective to get its damage up to where it needs to be. I just don't think it stacks up against the likes of the Flamethrower, or the Force Gun, or the Line Gun, so I usually just place it in my inventory after I pick it up. The other weapon for me that really doesn't compare to the others is the Contact Beam. Now it does actually work pretty well to finish off peeled enemies, but again it just isn't as efficient as the pulse rifle or plasma cutter in terms of ammo and other precision parts of the game. So in essence I would personally recommend the following loadout acquisition, plasma cutter, pulse rifle, flamethrower, line gun, with the latter eventually being replaced with the force gun, giving you two strong peelers in the form of a force gun and a flamethrower and two weak point specialists in the form of the cutter and the pulse rifle. Now let us talk briefly about upgrading and what you should prioritise in my opinion. I usually start with giving the plasma cutter one damage upgrade before upgrading some stasis and HP upgrades on the rig. 
In general, my approach is balanced. Get my main weapons, some damage upgrades, before returning to stasis and HP upgrades. However, by the time you get to the mid game, I would highly recommend that the plasma cutter or an additional precision weapon has some damage nodes upgraded, several in fact, so you can deal with the tentacles and the hive mind at the end of the game. If you use my flamethrower pulse rifle combo, you should find yourself with plenty of credits because you're being ammo efficient. If you choose to buy more nodes, you can do, and I did find myself buying 5 or 6 because I had plenty of credits to spare. However, in this playthrough, the suit upgrades must take priority, for the armour and inventory boost. For me using the flamethrower heavily, I did not have issues in buying these, as I didn't have to buy extra supplies and had plenty of cash for the next upgrade. Just make sure to always have a float of at least 20 to 30,000 when you know an upgrade's coming, because there's usually some semiconductors in the same level to make up the extra 10 to 20k. So with that all said, with our general loadouts and weapons sorted, let us now talk about some of the more dangerous moments in the game, things I would like to forewarn you about to make sure your run goes as smoothly as possible and you miss some frustrating deaths. Now, as I mentioned at the earlier part of this video, I did have to restart my impossible runs, twice in fact, dying once to an environmental hazard and later a difficult combat encounter in chapter 7. It was very frustrating. In addition to this, I had a few close shaves and so in this chapter I would like to give you a heads up on what I think are some real run killers. The first one is the centrifuge section in chapter 3, after you have restored power to it and you have to run around the outer ring to the elevator while you avoid getting hit by the spinning arm, which is of course an insta kill. Now I am adding this because while you may think it's easy, you can easily fall into the trap that I did, not taking it seriously and getting clipped. The main difficulty in this section is when a necromorph blocks your path on the second run, however I did discover a rather easy tip, just wait. If you stick your head out in the second part of the run, but hold back from making the run, the necromorph that blocks your path will eventually charge its way to you. It'll either be killed by the centrifuge arm, or it'll let you kill it, from the safety of the alcove. And after this, it is easy just to run alcove to alcove with no further direct impediments, aside from the necromorph that does ambush you in the second to last alcove, but that's in a safe area. Like I say, it's not too difficult, especially if you've done it before, but just be careful, as I lost concentration here, taking it too casually, and I got clipped just as I made it into the alcove, resulting in an insta death and the end of my first impossible run. The next part I want to highlight is a specific combat encounter that ended my second run, which is found on the lowest floor of the mining deck, Deck D Maintenance. This is the floor you would go to for Kine's secret base in Nicole's side quest, as well as where you find the SOS beacon for the main quest. The combat encounter in question takes place in the main room after you leave the lift, a tight space that is not only home to a guardian at an awkward angle, but down the ramps in the area where the guardian is, the floor is sticky, meaning you won't be able to run in this lower portion of the level. So I'm going to describe the best way to do this encounter safely. Coming into the main room after the elevator, there is a ramp going down directly ahead of you and a ramp going down left. Ignore the one directly in front of you as this will bring you very close to the Guardian, who is embedded on the wall down the front ramp to the right. Instead you need to go down the left hand ramp and deal with a problem already. There is an infector that is creating a slasher. Stasis them both and deal with them. After this you can look round the corner to the right and see the Guardian ahead of you. Maybe throw a stasis his way to slow down his pod production and maybe throw one of the canisters at him just to get started. However, you need to go back from where you came from, back to the elevator, as another infector has appeared behind you and is creating a new slasher. Again, deal with these two before heading back down the left hand ramp and killing the guardian from afar. Use stasis and there are three explosive barrels here and this should be enough to kill him. Now, if you effectively deal with this encounter as described, killing the infector at the front and then killing the infector that spawns behind you, it's fine. However, the difficulty of this fight comes with the cramped space, the goo slowing you down, as well as the infector that spawns behind you, and if you aren't aware of them, they can come down and flank you, pushing you closer to the Guardian, or in general making it very difficult for you. 
given the goo and the cramped conditions. This is exactly what happened to me, I got flanked by the infector and slasher from the elevator, and in a panic I rushed the guardian with my flamethrower and got beheaded. In a nutshell, kill the infector down the left hand ramp, stasis the guardian, and then come back and deal with the infector that has spawned behind you at the elevator. Another potentially dangerous moment comes in chapter 7 as well, when you need to pass by the asteroid to go out into the vacuum outside to destroy the two remaining gravity tethers and place the SOS beacon on the asteroid. The danger comes from the gravitational rings that spin round the asteroid. If these hit you when you're trying to pass by it, you will insta die. I remember this moment not because I died in Dead Space Remake, but because it was a source of one of my deaths in Dead Space Classic and it has stayed with me all this time. My recommendation is just go to the top right as there is a gap that opens up here every so often, so just wait there for the opening to come and then just speed through it as fast as you can. With that covered, let us come to another quite obvious one, the nuclear warhead encounter from the USM Valor in Chapter 9. For those who don't know, if you kill the exploder in this room that rushes you by detonating it, the whole room and ship will explode and you will insta die, so you have to kill the exploder without detonating its sack. My main recommendation is to use the projectiles found on the floor, the spikes, and TK the exploder through the body as you'll see me doing in the footage. It's quick and clean. Otherwise they are quite easy to kill just by regularly shooting them. Just shoot them in the body, not in their explosive arm. Shoot their single leg, shoot their other arm and they'll probably be dead. Just be careful if you have the stasis prototype not to stasis them, I'm honestly unsure whether this in time could detonate the exploder. Just pick up one of the spikes from the floor and pin that boy to the wall. One of the other moments is a bit of a strange one, but it almost caused my death so I want to cover all bases. And this is when you're fleeing the USM Valor after Hammond has died. When you are fleeing, you come across two twitchers in the mess hall that you pass through. Usually in most playthroughs I just run past these guys and it's never caused an issue. However on my impossible run, they manage to pursue me all the way to the airlock and the cinematic takes place in this airlock where Isaac jumps out and they were still here and they still hit me while the cinematic was taking place and it cost me health. They could have actually killed me in this cinematic. So long story short, kill these twitchers. You have no idea how much they're going to hit you in the back or if they'll even catch up to you for the cinematic and kill you while you're utterly helpless. So the next area that can be a bit dodgy is one on Aegis 7, in the second room where you're guiding the marker through the storage facility and you have to reactivate the gravity tether. After you reactivate it by moving all the batteries into their holders and activating the engine, you'll have to fly up through some fans. Now you'll know that you have to stasis these fans to fly through them safely. However, midway up you have to shoot some more flesh off of them and fly through some new fans. Now it might be a bit of a glitch, but when I was doing this on my latest run, I shot off the flesh and I just looked at one of the fans and it wasn't moving. I waited a couple of seconds and I was tempted to fly through it, but then all of a sudden it glitched and was suddenly moving. So when you're doing this bit, just make sure you stasis every single fan, even if there's a bit of a visual glitch like this. Just be careful. Finally, the last danger point is at the exact end moment of the game, hanging upside down from the hive mind, and we've already spoken about this. Just again, make sure your plasma cutter is upgraded and get ready to shoot that sucker. And if you're getting pulled too close and you think you're going to die, pause your game and close your game down. Yes, it's annoying you'll have to redo the whole hive mind fight, but really it's better than restarting the entire game again. The hunter sections aren't of massive concern to me, I don't know about you guys, I basically just always take his legs off and then stasis the guy, keep running away from him, pretty straightforward. So that's it guys, in summary, you just have to know the game well, manage your inventory effectively, master the hybrid peeling system, and prepare for some specific dangerous moments. I hope this helps you complete your impossible run. If you like Dead Space content and you like this video, please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. If you like Elden Ring lore content, please subscribe to my main channel, Smotown, which I will also link below. But until next time guys, I will see you on board the USG Ishimura. Take care, and I wish you all the luck with your impossible run.